Welcome back. We're now ready to dive into the class on uh, physics-based photo forensics. So by way of background, my name is Hani Farid. I'm a professor here at UC Berkeley, and I've been thinking about the problem of photo and video and audio authentication for about 20 years now. Uh, lots of really hard and interesting problems from the technical side of things, from the legal side of things, from the societal point of view, national security point of view. Um, we won't talk about all of them today, but let me just touch a little bit about sort of the space of photo forensics and then specifically what we will be doing in this space. Uh, I, I don't know how important it is, but I think it is, it's useful to understand that manipulating images is not new. As long as photography has been around, we've been manipulating photographs. So here, for example, you see Stalin, uh, Castro, Hitler in the bottom left, and Mussolini here on the horse. Um, and these were photos where in the first three, uh, some of the people you see in the photos fell out of favor. And so these dictators simply airbrushed them out of history. Uh, here, down here, this is my favorite one, maybe. Uh, Mussolini was getting on in age, was not quite as stable on his horse, so he needed a horse handler, which if you, if you look carefully, you can rewind the video, you'll notice that they airbrushed the horse handler out so he didn't look like he was quite as feeble as he was. Now, obviously, um, we did, we, we've never really been able to fully trust photography. Obviously, that has changed a lot in the digital age because to manipulate images here, you needed highly skilled uh, technicians who in the dark room were painting over negatives to remove people, um, to, to put the background in, and then re-exposing those. But it's important to understand, and, and I mention this because photo fakery is an evolving state. We are constantly changing the way images are captured, processed, manipulated, altered, and it's important to understand this has a long and rich history. Now, obviously, in the digital age, a lot has changed. I would argue somewhere around in the late 1990s, early 1990s, rather, things really started to get very complicated, in part because of digital technology, in part because of the then be very beginnings of the internet, and of course, programs like Adobe Photoshop, which over the period of some 25 years have evolved to have very sophisticated features that allow for increasingly more sophisticated ways to manipulate and alter images. And now, of course, from 2015 and on, we have the internet, we have social media, we have uh, everybody has a, an HD camera in their pockets. We, of course, have deep fakes, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, and we have the ability to transmit those to the world instantaneously, and the landscape has shifted quite a bit. Speaking of which, in addition to that problem of Photoshop over 25 years, we now have these monsters, which are the deep neural networks, which now allow for the whole cloth synthesis of fake audio, images, and video at the hands of somebody with a laptop. So there's a, a, a sophisticated and complex landscape out there, and let me just speak about a few things that I see that are complex. So first of all, we now have the ability to manipulate media in the traditional way. Take an image, put it into Photoshop or your favorite photo editing software, take somebody out, add somebody in, composite people together. We have a new way of manipulating content, which we'll be talking more about in this class, which are the so-called deep fakes, where now you have machine learning algorithms, primarily deep neural networks, but also things, uh, other types of computational uh, machinery that are synthesizing audio in somebody's voice, doing a face swap deep fake where you place one person's face with another person's face, um, creating images of people who've never existed to create fake profiles on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever. And so the, the technology is evolving very quickly. And of course, uh, come talk to me in a few years, and there'll probably be a plus whatever else the next uh, thing we have to deal with is. Now, we're also dealing with the manipulated media that is audio, image, video, and of course, text. GPT-3, Grover, the ability to whole cloth synthesize articles is now possible today. And now we have the full uh, main uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, manipulate all forms of uh, media. We actually have two problems in the forensic space. We have the manipulation problem, which is what I've been talking about up here, but we also have the misattribution problem, that you can just take an image and say this was a bombing in place X on time Y, but in fact it wasn't. So just completely authentic content but being misattributed is a huge problem in the forensic space, which adds, again, another level of complexity. Um, I've already mentioned, but and I think it's worth re-mentioning, is that it's not just that we can manipulate either traditionally or with new technology. It's not just that I have to deal with audio, images, video, and text. It's the speed and the scale at which we have to operate in today's internet. 
500 hours of YouTube video are uploaded every minute. Over a billion uploads to Facebook, half a billion tweets every day. The internet is massive, it is global, it is instantaneous, and it is fast. The half-life of a social media post is measured in hours. 50% of views happen in the first few hours, and so the speed and the scale that you have to operate on to deal with visual information is phenomenal. And because of that scale, the accuracy that you need to work at is unbearably high. If you have a 99% algorithm, that means you are making mistakes at the scale at the rate of one in 100. At internet scale, that is a complete disaster. You need to be 99.9999999 to work at internet scale. Now, obviously, if you're dealing in the one-off case in the courts, national security, that accuracy is less uh, critical. But at scale, this is very difficult. And let's not, by the way, forget is we have an adversary. We are not working with a benign space. We have people who are trying to actively fool us, and they are evolving very, very fast. So this is the landscape we face. Um, as I said earlier, I've been in this space for about 20 years now. Um, I've never seen anything move the way it has been moving in the last few years in this space, partly due to deep fakes, partly due to internet, partly due to just the sort of the whole ecosystem of misinformation of which visual and auditory misinformation is one part. But I would argue it's never been more important to be able to authenticate content, both at scale, but also in those critical uh, uh, scenarios as well. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. Now, the way I have been thinking about forensics, and, and if, if I, this is a shameless plug, uh, I have a book called Photo Forensics that was published in 2006 that has most of what we will be talking about, um, it, it, plus some other things in this class. Um, the way I have been thinking about photo forensics is to think about the entire imaging pipe pipeline. So out in the world, you have light, you have shadows, you have reflections, you have geometry. That light travels through the lens. From the last segment, we actually know what happens when light travels through that lens and hits the sensor. When you hit the lens, you have chromatic aberrations, you have vignetting, you have lens distortion as that light bounces around that lens. Uh, it, it strikes the sensor and gets converted from an analog to a digital signal. Lots of interesting things happening. There's a post-processing pipeline where lots of algorithms are applied to the image to clean it up. It eventually gets packaged into a JPEG, lossy compression, gets written out, maybe goes into Photoshop, eventually goes, it lands in Facebook, and eventually on your desk or my desk to analyze. And in this lifetime, if you will, of light from the world through the lens, sensor, packaging, Photoshop, desk, lots of interesting things happen. Uh, geometric regularities, physical regularities, statistical regularities. And, and the idea behind the way we've been thinking about this problem in my lab is to build explicit mathematical models for what we expect to see in an image and then look for deviations of those that are the results of manipulation. Okay, So it is a very, if you will, model-driven approach. We tend not to take the sort of classic machine learning approach, which is feed a deep neural network a bunch of fake images, feed it a bunch of real images, and let it sort itself out. Um, I'm a little critical of those techniques because, first of all, I think you don't really understand how they work. Um, I think you're incredibly vulnerable to adversarial attack because you have this complex bl black box. Um, and frankly, it's not very explainable. And I think it's important when you're doing forensic science to be able to explain what you're doing. And so we're going to be talking about these types of techniques. Now, in this class, we're going to be focused on techniques that live that are out in this space in the world. These are the physics-based techniques. Now, let me say a few things about the benefits and the drawbacks of that. And of course, lots of other things are happening here, lots of interesting thing, things to talk about. What I like about these physics-based te physics -based techniques is they tend to be more resilient to adversaries. They tend not to rely on these little JPEG artifacts or these little color filter array artifacts or some very subtle chromatic aberrations or maybe Photoshop does something ever so slightly wrong to the pixel values. Typically, when you're out here, you're out here, you're dealing with big whopping effects, and I like that forensically because it means it's hard for the adversary to undo that. In addition, you are often reasoning about the three-dimensional world, and the adversary is living in a two-dimensional world because they're in Photoshop or some deep neural network that doesn't know about the physical three-dimensional world, and that works to your advantage. The primary drawback of working out here in the physics space techniques is that today, they still need human intervention to be able to reason about certain mid to high level properties of the image. That's fine when you got the one-off case, but doesn't necessarily scale to 
analyzing 500 hours of video every minute on YouTube. Nevertheless, we're going to be talking about these world techniques, a number of different ones, and in particular, here's what we're going to be talking about. So, um, I'm going to break this up into three categories, physics-based forensics, physics-based analysis, and then deep fakes. So under physics-based forensics, which is, is it real or fake? Is it manipulated or not? We're going to be talking about vanishing points, reflections off of mirrored surfaces or shiny surfaces, shadows, lens flare. We're going to talk a little bit about human ability, because one of the things that you always, that we have this tendency to do when we look at images is to say, oh yeah, this looks right, this looks wrong. And it's, an, it's important to understand what your visual system is good at and what it is not good at. We'll talk about lighting and we'll talk about specularity. So you can see the theme here. We're talking about things that have to do with the physical world. Under physics-based analysis, I'll talk about 3D modeling. So if you remember from the previous segment, I said there is a fundamental loss of information when you project from the 3D world to the 2D image. And often we want to reason about the 3D world, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'll just talk about one, although very, very narrow niche technique on analyzing ballistic motion, because I think it gives you a flavor for some of the things that you can do with these physics-based analysis techniques. And then we'll wrap up talking about deep fakes. They're not specifically about physics-based, although some of the techniques will be physics-based E, um, but I think it's an important new horizon in the space of manipulation and forensics, and I think it's important to understand what they are, how are they being created, and how are we and others currently thinking about authenticating fake images, deep fake images, and deep fake audio, and deep fake video. Okay, that's it by way of introduction. I think we're ready to dive in, starting with vanishing points. So when we come back, we'll dig into some of the core material. See you in a little bit.